It's time for the three question warm up for Farm Basics 9. Let's get going. What substances are known teratogens? List as many as you can recall. So the more testable ones, because this is a pretty broad subject here, uh, would include ACE inhibitors, valproate and phenytoin, lithium, tetracycline, aminoglycosides, warfarin, excessive vitamin A, smoking, alcohol, cocaine, and diethylstilbestrol, or DES. Next question. Which regions of the brain are included in the limbic system? So this is the amygdala, the septal nucleus, the mammillary bodies, the fornix, the hippocampus, and the cingulate gyres. Next question. When performing a lumbar puncture for anesthesia administration, where is the anesthesia dosed and then where is the CSF found? So where it's dosed is going to be in the epidural space. Where the actual CSF is found is the subarachnoid space. All right, guys, that's it for the warm-up. Let's get to that lecture now. Before we get started, it's come to my attention that Dr. Lewis is pretty proud of his beard. The way he goes on and on and on about it, you'd think he's some kind of trailblazing facial hair pioneer. Newsflash, men have been growing beards for thousands of years, Chris. But it does get me wondering whether I should grow some facial hair of my own. I wonder how I'd look with an ironic handlebar mustache. Anyway, in this video we're going to be talking about drug metabolism. This is where our bodies perform some kind of chemical reactions on the drug, which usually inactivates it, but some medications are actually pro-drugs, which just means that they're administered as inactive compounds, and then when the body metabolizes them, then they become active. But eventually, even those drugs are going to undergo further metabolism and be inactivated. So there are two basic types of drug metabolism reactions, which we call phase one reactions and phase two reactions. Now, I don't want you to get too hung up on the terminology because you don't have to go through both phase one and phase two, and you don't have to do them in order either. You can do phase two reactions first, or some drugs only go through phase one or only go through phase two. Phase one reactions are hydrolysis, oxidation, and reduction. And these kinds of reactions result in slightly polar, water-soluble metabolites, which are often still active. Now, occasionally, phase one will inactivate a drug, but sometimes phase one reactions can activate a drug and make it more potent, like converting that pro-drug into the active drug. Or sometimes it can actually make a safe drug toxic. For instance, methanol undergoes oxidation, which is a phase one reaction. It undergoes oxidation to become formaldehyde, which is even more toxic than methanol was to begin with. And then phase two reactions include things like methylation or acetylation or glucuronidation or sulfation. So these are all conjugation reactions. Remember, conjugation means that you're joining the drug to some other molecule, like adding a methyl group or adding an acetyl group, or you're joining the drug to glucuronic acid or to sulfate or maybe to glutathione. And all these phase two reactions result in very polar inactive metabolites that are easy to excrete in the urine. We're going to talk about that more in the next video, but those highly polar hydrophilic molecules cannot cross cell membranes very readily, so they're going to get trapped in the urine and then excreted. So both phase one and phase two reactions take place primarily in the liver, but sometimes in the kidneys. So a drug might go through phase one metabolism on the first pass through the liver, and then go through phase two on the second pass. Or another drug might go through phase two on the first pass through the liver, and then go through phase one on the second pass or it might go through both phases on one pass through the liver. It just varies from drug to drug. But in general, I want you to remember phase one reactions are hydrolysis, oxidation, and reduction, and they create a slightly polar molecule that's still active. Phase two reactions are conjugation reactions that create a very polar molecule that's inactive. There are three other quick bullet points that I want you to remember. First, cytochrome P450 enzymes generally perform phase one reactions. Now, we're going to come back to cytochrome P450 in a second, but remember for right now, phase one, P450. The second quick bullet point is that elderly patients typically lose the ability to do phase one metabolism first, but they can still do those phase two conjugation reactions like glucuronidation and acetylation and so on. And then the third bullet point is that some people are what we call slow acetylators. They just don't acetylate drugs very readily. What kind of reaction was acetylation? It's a conjugation reaction. It's a phase two reaction. That means these people are going to be slow to inactivate certain drugs. So if you keep dosing the drug normally, but the patient is inactivating that drug more slowly than expected, that drug is going to build up, and that patient will have higher than average drug levels. So that patient is at higher risk of drug toxicity and side effects. So again, slow acetylators have higher drug levels and more risk of toxicity. 
So even though most people have to take a drug twice a day, for instance, some people might only need to take it once a day or every other day or whatever. Let's talk for a moment about the cytochrome P450 enzymes. Now, this is a family of enzymes that catalyze a huge variety of reactions. Some of the P450 enzymes are involved in things like bile acid synthesis or steroid synthesis. And some P450 enzymes are involved with drug metabolism. Now, you're going to see it abbreviated CYP, and then you'll see a number, a letter, and another number. So, for example, one of the most important enzymes that metabolizes a bunch of different drugs is called CYP3A4. That's cytochrome P450, family 3, subfamily A, form 4. There are about 12 different enzymes that metabolize 85 to 90 percent of the drugs that we use. CYP3A4 by itself metabolizes around 50 percent of drugs. So, what difference does all this make clinically? Well, if you give two drugs that are both metabolized by the exact same P450 enzyme, it's going to take longer for both of those drugs to be inactivated because there's only so much of the enzyme around. So, if you give both drugs at the same time, you might have increased plasma levels or you might have prolonged action of one or both drugs. So, that's where drug-drug interactions come from. Then, apart from drug-drug interactions, sometimes drugs and foods and even herbal supplements can either inhibit CYP enzymes or they can induce the expression of CYP enzymes. And since these CYP enzymes can be involved in either activating or inactivating drugs, inducing CYP enzymes could potentially increase drug activity or it might reduce drug activity. So, you have to look it up and figure it out for any given drug interaction. You can't just make a blanket statement. Now, you need to be familiar with a few of the drugs that are most commonly implicated in inhibiting and inducing these P450 enzymes. So let's look at these in the study guide number four and number five. Number four has a list of drugs that are well known for inhibiting cytochrome P450. Now this is only a partial list, but these are some of the most common, most notorious ones. There are tons of different mnemonics out there to help you remember all these, but our mnemonic is crack amigos. So the first C is for ciprofloxacin. R is for ritonavir, which is a protease inhibitor. Now, this is actually a class effect of the protease inhibitors. They're actually designed to inhibit cytochrome P450. The A is for amiodarone. The second C is for cimetidine. The K is for ketoconazole. Then the A in amigos is for acute alcohol use. Chronic alcohol use actually induces P450, as we're going to see in just a moment, but acutely alcohol intake will inhibit P450. The M is for macrolides, like erythromycin or azithromycin. The I is for isoniazid. G is for grapefruit juice. So again, it isn't just drugs that affect drug metabolism, but diet and supplements can do it too. O is for omeprazole. And S is for sulfonamides. Sulfonamides can cause lots of different side effects, and they also inhibit cytochrome P450. So if you can remember crack amigos, that's going to help you remember the short list of high-yield P450 inhibitors. And if you have a hard time remembering which list is the inhibitors and which list is the inducers, maybe think about how crack cocaine is a dangerous drug and you should inhibit yourself from using it. Or think about how drug cartels inhibit law and order. Then on number five, we have the P450 inducers. And a student at Western U in California sent us this mnemonic. Guinness, Coronas, and PBRs induce chronic alcoholism. So first of all, the G in Guinness is for griseofulvin, which is an antifungal drug. The C in coronas is carbamazepine, which is a seizure drug. Then PBRs, in this case, does not stand for Pap's Blue Ribbon. The P stands for phenytoin, which is another seizure drug. The B is for barbiturates. R is for rifampin. And then make sure that you're making this plural. It's PBRs because that S is for St. John's wort, which is an herbal supplement that's supposed to help treat depression. And again, if a patient decides to start taking St. John's wort on his own and doesn't tell you about it, it can induce his P450 enzymes and mess with his drug levels of lots of different medications. So again, Guinness, Coronas, and PBRs induce chronic alcoholism because that tells you that these drugs uh, induce P450. And it also helps you remember that chronic alcoholism will induce P450. But remember, we said that acute use of alcohol will inhibit P450 enzymes. And speaking of alcohol, let's wrap this up by talking about the metabolism of ethanol. Now, you know the organ that's primarily responsible for metabolizing alcohol is the liver. And there are two key enzymes that you need to remember. There's an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase that converts ethanol to acetaldehyde. And then the enzyme acetaldehyde dehydrogenase converts acetaldehyde to acetate. So it's pretty easy. Now, both of these enzymes are dehydrogenases. So they dehydrogenate. They remove a hydrogen. Then you have to do something with those hydrogens you're removing. So these enzymes transfer the hydrogen ions to NAD, which is the active form of niacin. 
that NAD is a cofactor, and that cofactor is the limiting reagent in alcohol metabolism. And you also need to know the drugs that inhibit each of these enzymes. The first enzyme, which is alcohol dehydrogenase, is inhibited by a drug called fomepazole. Now, fomepazole is used to treat methanol poisoning and ethylene glycol poisoning. And then the second enzyme, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, is inhibited by a drug called disulfiram, which we use to treat alcoholism. So let's talk about fomepazole for just a second. Methanol and ethylene glycol are both metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenase. Now, methanol is wood alcohol, and occasionally alcoholics might try to get drunk on methanol. But remember we said that instead of getting metabolized to acetaldehyde, methanol gets metabolized to formaldehyde, which is toxic. Formaldehyde can cause acidosis, and it can cause retinal damage and blindness, even in relatively small amounts, like 15 cc's or three shots of methanol. So it's very, very dangerous. If you drank a whole bottle of methanol, you could die. So to treat methanol poisoning, we want to prevent the metabolism of methanol to formaldehyde. So we want to inhibit this enzyme, alcohol dehydrogenase. So if we give the patient fomepazole, it's going to inhibit alcohol dehydrogenase and prevent formation of formaldehyde. You could also give the patient a bunch of ethanol, and basically ethanol competes with methanol for the enzyme, so that that's going to slow down the formaldehyde formation. Or you could do dialysis to remove the methanol. We also said that you could use fomepazole to treat ethylene glycol poisoning. Now, ethylene glycol is antifreeze, right? People don't try to get drunk on it, but apparently antifreeze tastes pretty sweet, so kids and pets will sometimes drink it if they find it. So when you drink a nice antifreeze cocktail, the ethylene glycol gets metabolized to oxalic acid and other organic acids, which again causes acidosis. It's a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. If you remember the mnemonic mud piles for the causes of high anion gap metabolic acidosis, the M in mud piles is for methanol and the E is for ethylene glycol. So ethylene glycol causes a metabolic acidosis and it can also lead to kidney damage, CNS problems, and heart and lung toxicity. But especially remember the kidney damage because the oxalic acid precipitates out as calcium oxalate crystals in the kidney. And again, you can prevent this by giving fomepazole to inhibit alcohol dehydrogenase or by giving ethanol to compete for the enzyme. So that's the first enzyme. Well, what about the second enzyme, which is acetaldehyde dehydrogenase? We said you could inhibit that one with a drug called disulfiram. And we said we use that in treating chronic alcoholism. Actually, we use disulfiram to discourage alcoholics from drinking. So say you have an alcoholic in recovery and you give him disulfiram, that's going to inhibit acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. And if the patient relapses and starts drinking again, acetaldehyde will build up in his body and that's going to cause flushing, sweating, headache, nausea and vomiting, and hypotension. So these patients learn not to drink alcohol because they know it's going to make them sick. There are also a few other drugs that can cause this disulfiram-like reaction like metronidazole, which is probably the most important one, certain cephalosporins, procarbazine, which is a cancer drug used to treat Hodgkin lymphoma, and first-generation sulfonylureas, like tolbutamide, which nobody ever uses anymore. So if you start somebody out on one of these drugs, for instance, if you start a patient on metronidazole for diverticulitis or something, you need to tell the patient to avoid drinking alcohol while they're taking the medicine because it may make them sick. And that's it for Farm Basics 9. Now it's time for the end of session quiz. So go ahead and answer those, and then I'll go over the answers with you. All right, let's go through these. First question, which hepatic phase of metabolism is lost first by geriatric patients? That's phase one. And which phase is mediated by cytochrome P450? That's also phase one. Next, which medication inhibits acetaldehyde dehydrogenase? That's disulfiram. Next one, which medication inhibits alcohol dehydrogenase? That's fomepazole. And the last one lists seven inducers and 11 inhibitors of cytochrome P450. So for the inducers, our mnemonic was Guinness, Coronas, and PBRs induce chronic alcoholism. And that stands for griseofulvin, carbamazepine, phenytoin, barbiturates, rifampin, St. John's wort, and then chronic alcoholism. And then for the inhibitors, the mnemonic was crack amigos, which is for ciprofloxacin, ritonavir, and other protease inhibitors, amiodarone, cimetidine, ketoconazole, acute alcohol use, macrolides, isoniazid, grapefruit juice, omeprazole, and sulfonamides. All right, that's it for Farm Basics 9. I'll see you next time. Good day, students. Have you been paying attention? 
This is one I am sure you know. What dietary restriction should you warn patients about when starting metronidazole? Metronidazole has disulfiram-like effect, so they will need to avoid alcohol. I myself love to wind down at the end of the day with just a teensy bit of schnapps. Don't tell the missus though, the old ball and chain. <laughs>